Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm David Pryor. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here. And in behalf of the Institute and the John F. Kennedy School of Government, we welcome you this evening. And we're very, very grateful that you're here for this very exciting program that we have. We have on this stage, in my opinion, some of the great legends of the civil rights history of America. We have some of the bravest people on this stage that I think that we could be honoring tonight on the 45th anniversary of the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. It is a real honor for me to be able tonight to recognize Mr. Fred Gray. Gray is right here in the uh, middle. Dr. Dorothy Height. Dorothy Height is right here. Juanita Abernathy, Mrs. Ralph Abernathy. And presiding over our meeting tonight will be that very, very distinguished professor from the Harvard Law School, Dr. Charles Ogletree. And we will look forward to his presentations in just a moment. But tonight we are so fortunate that we have people like this in our country who have led such a great and magnificent struggle. I think that they believe, like many of us believe, that that struggle is a long way from being over. But tonight we want to start our program, if we could, by uh, recognizing Mr. Jeff Bukas. Jeff, where, there are you. Now, y'all may not know who this great gentleman is, but if any of you have ever wanted to be in the movies, this is your chance. He is the chairman of the board of HBO, Home Box Office. And tonight he has a very, very special uh, surprise for us. Not a surprise, but a very, very special gift that he's going to share with us. It is a film which is going to open in February uh, of this coming winter, February of this winter. And so this is the first group that's going to be able to see just a short segment, about a 10 or 11 minute segment of this film that HBO is so proudly uh, unveiling tonight. And I can tell you I have seen it. It is staggering, it is magnificent, and of course it is most challenging. Also, to thank Ketchum Communications, who have helped to arrange this tonight. We're very, very grateful uh, to you, sir, for all of the help that you have been in helping our staff here at the Institute of Politics make this event possible. So with that said, let us lower the lights and see a few minutes of the film. In the year 1619, the first Negro slaves landed in ships on the shores of this nation. Nearly 400 years later, the Negro in America still is not free. Not free. Not free. Not free. Not free. Ain't nothing wrong with wanting what's right. People around here have been wanting what's right all along. First, I would like to thank you all for coming out. You didn't have to do that. We are here this evening for serious business. We are here because of the bus situation in Montgomery. Just the other day, one of the finest citizens in Montgomery, not one of the finest Negro citizens, but one of the finest citizens in Montgomery was taken from a bus and carried to jail and arrested because she refused to get up and give her seat to a white person. I need that seat. Go on, move back to the code section. Move. No. I gotta enforce the segregation laws. It's my duty. She's the one. She's the one. A white person needs a seat. She's the one. She's the one. You go on. 
You do what you gotta do. We have a real chance here to challenge the bus segregation law. Why can't Robinson, we got two days to tell every Negro in Montgomery to stay off of the buses. One of them's a Sunday. I don't see how we can do that without the minister. Well, hey, hey, young man. Now take this home here. Yeah? Nobody rides the buses Monday. Got bus that? Bus boycott on Monday. Now, why are they having the meeting at your church? E.D. asked. He thought it'd be neutral ground. And we have a nice meeting room. and they do not have a stomach for it. Let's tell the truth! Let's tell the truth! Let's tell the truth! It's our women who've been carrying the torch. It's our women who've been getting arrested while y'all hide behind their skirts like a bunch of damn cowards. Brother Nixon, Brother Nixon, uh, I'm not a coward, and I don't want anybody calling me a coward, but I agree with you. Uh, the time has come to stop hiding. Now, uh... Mrs. Parks didn't hide this morning before that judge, and we should act openly. We are committed to segregation, both by custom and by law, and we intend to maintain it and to protect our way of life. I feel we need a minister to unite our entire community. I think he ought to be uh, a young man, a strong man, because <laughs> we know this job is going to take. Amen. Dr. King, this is the day we have waited for. It's now all up to you. Well, here we are, 77 days into a one-day boycott. Mass action and black social gospel. It's a new form of protest. I mean, it's, it's, it's Negro. It's jazz. <laughs> we are not walking, we are marching! Folks are gonna have to get smart and join the clan. What is it? Your house has been bombed, Martin. Now, let's just go on back to our homes. It's all over now. No, it ain't all over. It's just stuck. We ain't going nowhere. That crowd out there, that hatred can't be contained. Martin, I don't pretend to understand why you've been chosen. I really don't. You have. You are the right man. When do we get to fight back? Brother King. Brother King, there are people out there. They, they want to take matters into their own hands. We will do no such thing. We are Christians. If you must stone them, stone them with forgiveness. If you must stone them, stone them with love. Through these powers, we will discover to our wayward brothers the error of their ways. This is and will ever be a nonviolent movement. And now I introduce to you 
the president of the newly founded Montgomery Improvement Association. Reverend King, you know, my friend, there comes a time when people get tired of being trampled by the iron feet of oppression. There comes a time, my friend, when people get tired of being thrown across the abyss of humiliation, where they experience the bleakness of nagging despair. There comes a time when people get tired of being pushed out of the glittering sunlight of life to lie and left standing amidst the piercing chill of an alpine November. We're here. We're here because we're tired now. And we're not wrong in what we're doing. If we are wrong, the Supreme Court of this nation is wrong. If we are wrong, the Constitution of the United States is wrong. If we are wrong, God Almighty is wrong. If we are wrong, Jesus of Nazareth was merely a utopian dreamer and never came down to earth. If we are wrong, justice is a lie. And we are determined to work together here in Montgomery to work and to fight until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. a time when time itself is ready for a change. Let me welcome you to the Institute of Politics at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. And I'm glad that uh, HBO will be doing this important uh, presentation in February of 2001. Uh, it is a timely presentation of one of the most important historic events. <coughs> and I hope you watch it. But I also hope that you are careful when you watch it and not allow the fictionalized version of history to misguide you about what happened uh, and the significant events that occurred more than 45 years ago. This Friday, December 1st, actually marks the 45th anniversary uh, of, I think, one of the most historic events to ever happen in our nation's history. And it's not just about civil rights. That would be too trivial uh, and too minor uh, a mention of history to call it a civil rights movement. It's much more than that. It's about human rights. It's about dignity. Uh, it's about America. And it's about a form of protest and patriotism that we should never forget. Tonight, we have three of the uh, living monuments uh, to that movement, and it's important that we recognize how important that is. At times like this, you can say that you're here to hear about history. That's one of the aspects, because every single one of these panelists were actively involved in that movement. But in another respect, we're also making history, that you are the next generation who will hear from uh, the original sources about what happened, and they will challenge you today to understand the importance of voting, of democracy, and of education. The same battles they fought for 45 years ago are as important now uh, as they uh, were 45 years ago. And finally, I, I, I hope that you will never use the term dream team again lightly, because it's not about making money or television. Uh, or getting uh, attention. It's about a real dream. And every one of these panelists are true dreamers. And they had a dream without even realizing that uh, it could actually happen in their lifetimes. Uh, and I think that you will appreciate the scope and magnitude of what they did after you hear from them tonight and get a chance to engage them. Uh, to my immediate left uh, is Juanita Abernathy. And each of these three individuals has a unique place in history. Miss Abernathy, in her own right, a native of Alabama, 
I was educated in the public schools there, went to Tennessee State University, and was a school teacher. And has been a very successful uh, business person, uh, and now is the president and CEO of the Ralph David Abernathy Foundation. Uh, and she was there uh, when her husband put his life on the line every single day as, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s right-hand man, involved in the struggles, the protests, the meetings, uh, the prayers to try to promote justice uh, in Alabama and throughout the country and as a, stands as a living symbol of resistance uh, and commitment. Uh, next to Ms. Abernathy is Fred Gray, uh, one of America's most significant uh, and successful lawyers. Not black lawyer, not civil rights lawyer, but lawyer. Uh, he has changed the fabric in the legal profession in ways that many of you would never imagine. He represented not only Dr. Martin Luther King uh, during his many protests and arrests in Alabama, but he represented Rosa Parks when she was arrested as a result of the Montgomery boycott. But he also represented the black men who were senseless victims of the Tuskegee uh, experiments uh, at that time, having them suffer from uh, syphilis and other diseases, not having it treated. And he has been a historic figure and has written about it in many important books uh, over the time. But he is a lawyer not for money or for fame, but simply for justice and doing the right thing that motivated him and continues to motivate him as the senior partner in his law firm in Alabama. And finally, to my far left, uh, really is, uh, since the, one of the important mothers of the civil rights movement, Dorothy Hyde, uh, did something that was uh, historic in organizing and leading the movement that was supported by Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, buttressed by uh, uh, Mary Beth McLeod uh, Bethune, uh, and also became the symbol uh, when she ran the National uh, Council of Negro Women for many, many decades. But she did more than that. She was there in the movement. Uh, she's received every conceivable award. She's received dozens of honorary degrees. And in 1994, President Clinton had the good sense to give her the highest civilian medal available to anyone, uh, the Medal of Freedom. And she has traveled not only across this land, but across the world, in South Africa, and South America, and Europe, talking about justice, fighting for women's rights at a time when women couldn't serve on juries, uh, women couldn't vote, and had no rights. She was there as a black woman, uh, heralding the importance of every vote counting and every person counting. So this is the true 21st Dream Team, and you are part of that history tonight. And I hope you will, in a true Harvard tradition, recognize what you have here and join me in welcoming the true dream team of the civil rights movement tonight. What these three great leaders have to say, each of them could take days uh, to report to you their personal experiences, recalling history of the people they've worked with. What they're going to do is take a few minutes to give you just a very short summary perspective of the importance of this movement in the 1950s. And then after three of them speak briefly, we're going to go to your questions. Uh, and this is where we will truly see democracy at work. Uh, because, uh, like any other forum, as much as you have a lot of things to say, I hope you will learn, and I don't see many of my law school students here, so you will learn how to ask a question and not make a speech. Uh, and we have four microphones, two on this floor level, where you can ask a question after you identify yourselves. And there are two, one to the left and one to the right upstairs. We'll take all your questions. And I will uh, operate the prerogative of the chair to make sure your question is brief by cutting it off uh, if it doesn't get to the point. Let's start first with Ms. Abernathy. Thank you so much, Mr. Ogletree. Um, I came with a prepared script, and um, I'm sitting here cutting it. I, I thought I had 10 minutes, but I have five. So what I'm going to begin with is um, Montgomery, 1955. 45 years ago, that seems like only yesterday, but then again, it seems so far away. I'm going to read this so that I can get all of it in very quickly. Take your time. Allow me to read it very fast. Take your time. We're fine. Now, as the nation, nation pauses to remember the bus boycott and honor the struggle, the victory, 
the heroes and the heroines, the courage of a people, and the spirit of nonviolent protest. I cannot help but pause to remember my life and how it changed forever. My husband was a young minister, pastor of the historic First Baptist Church of Montgomery, Alabama, and above all, a man wedded to the spirit of God's word. A graduate of Alabama State University, Ralph joined the faculty of the university as a teacher counselor. It was there that he met Joanne Robinson, who was an English teacher also at Alabama State University, and an advocate for the Negro women of Montgomery, and a very, very vibrant, vibrant spokesperson. I was also a teacher at that time at Tuskegee Institute High School and Business Administration until my first child was born. Ralph's mentor was Dr. Vernon Johns, an older and seasoned minister in the community. Dr. Johns was a great pioneer of economic and political thought in Montgomery and the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church until the church accepted one of his, his last dramatic resignation. Dr. John's de departure from the church, the church called Reverend Martin Luther King of Atlanta for a trial sermon. Hearing of Dr. King's invitation, Dr. John's caught a ride from Atlanta to Montgomery to our house on South, South Hall Street. That evening was a reunion for Ralph and Martin because they had met when Ralph was a student at Atlanta University Graduate School and Martin was an undergraduate student at Morehouse College, also in Atlanta. For me, that was the first time I had met Martin Luther King, Jr. I had prepared a great dinner and I can cook. <laughs> <laughs> and as usual, enjoyed engaging in conversation with the ministers about the church and the outrageous oppression of Negroes in the South and all over the country. You know, the Dred Scott decision had rendered us three-fifths of a person. And Jim Crow laws simply compounded these asinine and hate-filled philosophies. Martin accepted the pastorate of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church and brought his bride, Coretta, to Montgomery. You know, at that time, restaurants were segregated. So as young couples, we alternated between each other's homes for dinner, and an eternal bond of friendship developed between the two young pastors and their families. But on December 5th, 1955, our lives changed forever. You know the story. Ralph used to always say that in order to understand why and how the Negroes of Montgomery took to the streets, you must first understand and know the spirit of Rosa Parks. Gentle, kind, and loving is and was Rosa Parks. Rosa was not the first, but the third woman to be arrested on the bus lines. But when Rosa, the secretary of the NAACP, was arrested, we said, enough is enough, Montgomery. We have had enough of your hateful racism, We've had enough of being left out of America's mainstream. We have tried to uh, tolerate your abuse of our women on the buses. We're tired, though, of being cursed by the drivers, called black bitches, black apes, niggers, cows, and all sorts of nasty names. No longer would we financially support a system that morally assaulted the essence of our being. We decided to walk in dignity rather than ride in shame. And for 381 days, in the rain, sleet, blistering summer heat, and winter's cold chill, we walked. A new improved Negro was born in Montgomery, Alabama, with pride and dignity that would inject new meaning into the fabric of this nation. We were all ordinary people forced to endure extraordinary circumstances. The courage and spirit of a people rose to that magnanimous occasion and changed the course of American history forever. The irritability of the community and the mistreatment of the people by the bus drivers was so intolerable that it forced the spontaneity of the movement in a collective socialized, popular, cohesive way. 
That was one of the unique aspects of the Montgomery bus boycott. The white community had no idea that the Negroes were restless, dissatisfied, frustrated, and weary of the bus driver's cruelties. They never envisioned any sort of collective, cohesive action by Negroes. Montgomery taught the world that the collective efforts of committed people to a given cause could change the course of history, and we did. The emotional stimulation within the community was contagious. The experiences of the past, the mistreatment, abuse, and et cetera, served as stimulation for the cohesiveness within the group. Those experiences will forever live in the annals of history. Now, why do we remember? We remember so that we will never repeat those atrocities again. We remember because he who forgets his past is doomed to repeat it, and we do not plan to go backward. Why do we celebrate? We celebrate the victory and victories which the dedication of committed individuals can accomplish and have accomplished through love and nonviolent resistance. We are still struggling and fighting the evils of injustice and equality in our society. We are not a just society yet. We must first recognize racism among us before we can eradicate it. In our country today, we do not even want to be reminded that it exists which says to me we do not intend to do anything about it. We see the injustices in the boardrooms and corporate halls, halls of Congress, state houses, educational and religious institutions. In fact, in every facet of our American society. We are better off than we were in 1955, but we have a long way to go. We are still not a colorblind society and none of us are free until all of us are free. Mr. Gray. Thank you very much, Professor Ogletree and Dr. Prime, to uh, my great inspirer, Dr. Height, who looks younger every time I see her, <laughs> to my good friend, uh, Mrs. Abernathy Juanita, who makes some of the best ice cream you've ever tasted. <laughs> and I haven't forgotten that <laughs> after all these years. As a matter of fact, I have your recipe and I use it every night. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm honored to be here this evening. And I think Juanita has given you uh, the setting. And I'm going to do, do a little with the historical aspect and then talk a little about the legal aspect and probably see where we are now and where we go from here. This evening, we discuss the nation remembers celebrating the 45th anniversary of the Montgomery bus boycott. And I would like to, for you to understand that what happened in Montgomery on December 1st, 1955, did not happen by chance. It did not begin on December 1st. Rather, it was the straw which broke the camel's back. Mrs. Abernathy has discussed with you and have given you some of the background of the injustices which had occurred. And frequently I'm asked the question, how did I get involved in the movement? And I think I need to tell you because as young people, you have your future in your hands, and you may just have the future of many other individuals in your hands. While I was a student at Alabama State, and Alabama State was the historically black school in Montgomery, I lived on the west side of town, 
the ghetto aspect, not on the east side where the university was located. And unlike those of you who have automobiles, most of us didn't have automobiles in the 50s. I'm talking about 1951 when I became a student. So I lived in Montgomery, was born in Montgomery. I rode the bus from as little as twice a day to as much as six times a day because I had to go from where I live across town to school. Then I worked for the newspaper and their office was downtown. My district was on the east side of town. I had to go back. Then I have to go back to the newspaper to check out and then frequently back on campus in the evening and then finally home. So I knew and I had seen many of our people experience segregation, indignities on the buses. And at that time, and at this point, I'm now a, a, a junior at Alabama State. And the name of the school then was Alabama State College for Negroes. And I observed we had no black lawyers. There were no white lawyers in Montgomery who would handle any civil rights cases. If you were black, and if you had a problem, it simply meant if it was a racial matter, you could forget about it because you were at the mercy of the power structure. I decided, and I had gone to high school to become a minister, and really was a minister long before I was a lawyer. Most people don't know about that, but it's true. But I decided that if there were at least one lawyer in Montgomery that would handle civil rights cases, maybe things could be different. I made a secret commitment to myself, and I had enough sense not to tell anybody for 35 years. And that secret commitment was I was going to leave Alabama, become a lawyer, because I could not attend the University of Alabama Law School because of my color. Come back to Alabama, pass the Alabama bar exam, and destroy everything segregated I could find. That was my personal commitment. Now, I know you can say, well, it's easy for you to sit here now, 45 years later, almost 50, and say that. But if you look at the history and look at what I did, I left Montgomery. I finished college in 1951. Went to Western Reserve University, now in Case Western. Every course I took in law school, I determined every point of law, whether it followed Alabama law or the general law. I was preparing myself to go back to Alabama. Every research paper I did in law school, I did it on Alabama law. And I had enough, I was able to finish law school in my three years, but I, I thought I'd better stop by Columbus and take the Ohio bar just in case. <laughs> And then six months later, I took the Alabama bar and was able to finish both, to pass both the first time. So on September the 8th, 1954, I became a lawyer. And in, I immediately, I already knew Mr. E.D. Nixon, who was Mr. Civil Rights. I knew Mrs. Rosa Parks, who worked with the youth in the community. E.D. Nixon had encouraged me to form the YAD, Young Alabama Democrats, in order to encourage high school students and college age students to become registered voters and have their parents to become registered voters. And I had started such a group. And included with that group was a group of young men and young women who lived in a community called King Hill. And one of the persons involved in that group was a young lady named Claudette Carvin. Some of you all may not have even heard of Claudette Carvin, unless you read a few books. Mm -hmm. Claudette Carvin was a 15-year-old high 
high school student at Booker T. Washington School in Montgomery, who on March the 3rd, 1955, nine months before Mrs. Parks was arrested, boarded a bus in Montgomery, Alabama at the same place Mrs. Parks boarded the bus. She went one block in another direction on Capitol Heights bus. She was asked to get up and give her seat. Now when Claudette did not give up her seat, she was not as nice and kind as Mrs. Parks was nine months later. They had to literally drag her off the bus. So Claudette Carvin, I represented Claudette Carvin. Claudette was the, the first civil rights case that I handled. And I was ready then to file a lawsuit to integrate the buses. But there were other cooler heads in Montgomery who recognized that maybe I didn't quite know what I was doing, mm -hmm. and they waited. But Joanne Robinson, another great person who was involved in the movement. And I mention these persons because frequently we, we don't know about them. And there are so many unsung heroes. I called Claudette Carvin last night and I told her, I said, I'm gonna be speaking to you here. I said, is there any message you want me to give to the persons who are here? And she said, well, Mr. Gray, I know you'll tell them what you think should happen. But just like Claudette and just like Mary Louise Smith, who was the other young lady who was arrested during the summer of 1955, but we didn't know about Mary Louise Smith case until after Mrs. Parks was arrested. She simply paid a $5 fine and went ahead. But if there had been no Claudette Carvin, if there had been no E.D. Nixon, if there had been none of these other unknown persons who really worked to lay the foundation, we may never have had the civil rights movement to develop as it developed. So I say all of that to you to let you know that you play and can play a real role if you are willing to be committed. And my handling of Claudette's case and representing Mrs. Rosa Parks and representing Dr. Martin Luther King and representing Reverend Abernathy uh, in the New York Times case, and you law students know about Sullivan versus New York Times. That case really came out of the bus boycott. Uh, the whole history came out of Dr. King's tax case. So the civil rights movement not only brought law in the field of civil rights, but it brought other great pieces of law that came into being as direct result of what happened in the civil rights movement. From there, I filed cases to desegregate uh, all of the institutions of higher learning in Alabama transportation systems, airports, uh, employment cases. And I did that because I was committed to be sure that the conditions as they existed then did not continue to exist. What I usually say, and I know my time is about up, On the 2nd of February in 56, we filed a lawsuit which integrated the buses. But that was just the beginning of a long series of events. I like to think of the chronology that happened in Montgomery for about 18 months, and you can kind of see how these things moved. On September 7th, 1954, at that time I was 23 years of age, and I was admitted to practice law in Montgomery. Seven weeks later, on October the 3rd, 54, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, was installed as the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. Five months later, Claudette Carving, on March 2nd, 1955, was arrested, and I represented her. On October of 1955, Mary Louise Smith was arrested under similar circumstances. Four weeks later, on November 7, 1955, Judge Frank M. Johnson, Jr. became United States District Judge for the Middle District of Alabama, just 23 days before Rosa Parks was arrested on December 1st. On December 1st, 55, you know Mrs. Parks was arrested. 
on the field. She was convicted. We had the beginning of the bus boycott. The rest of it is history. On February the 2nd of 56, the suit was filed to integrate the buses. God silently moved from September of 1954 to December 1955 to February 1956 and brought together the events and persons in one place and at one time, which resulted in changing the course of history in this country. Thank you very much. Dr. Hyde. Thank you, Mr. Ogletree. Thank you. I appreciate so much <clears throat> the opportunity to be here with Juanita Abernathy and Fred Gray. I wasn't in Montgomery. I was born in Richmond, Virginia. But when my parents were four years old, they moved to Pennsylvania so that I grew up in Pennsylvania and later went to college in New York and I've been on the East Coast. But as I sit here, I feel enriched even with hearing again and wishing I could hear even more of what it was that people were doing at the, at the central points of the struggle. And I am grateful that our lives got connected. I had known Martin Luther King Jr. I met him when he, as a exceptionally able student, had been admitted to Morehouse College. He was just 15 years old. And I sat with him in the home of Dr. Benjamin Mays, the president of the college, as he told of his questions as to what he was going to be, what he was going to do. That was in 1945. Ten years later, he was my leader. And I felt connected from the very moment that the word came about Rosa Parks to the whole situation that was there. And I am looking forward to this Friday, December 1st, when we will all celebrate and honor Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama, observing and commemorating the 45th anniversary of the boycott and of her work, but also seeing a museum that will be established, uh, a library where it will be possible for generations to come to go and get a sense of just what happened. And I always feel good that Mrs. Parks says to me that she's pleased that I sometimes tell her story differently from what you hear about her being tired as, as one in Abernathy said. She, wasn't, she said she was tired, like you're always tired at the end of every day of work or every day of school for that matter. But that she was tired of injustice. She was tired of being treated in such a, an inhumane fashion. I heard her in 1956 and tell the story as earlier in life. And what she said was that when she got to the bus, she did not sit on the first seat that she saw, which many people feel. She did not sit in the white section. She sat in the section reserved for blacks. But you see, the system was that there was a place that marked the seat. And as a bus filled with whites, the person who was sitting on the first seat in the black row was to move the sign back and take the sign with her and move back. And she refused to move back. And I think it's important for us to know that Rosa Parks dealt with a system and that we have to be conscious of how we change systems, that we don't always have to be there. They operate for us. They continue the racism, the institutionalized racism. And that's what Rosa Parks resisted and changed when she refused to go back and give her seat to a white man. One of the things 
that I've often thought about it. And as I hear Juanita Abernathy, I think again. At that time, of course, we know that the minister at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church was among those who came to the jail, and we know the rest of the story. But at that time, black people didn't own the media. You know, uh, who's it Gladys Knight sings? They heard it on the grapevine. Well, it was just about that way. But it, was, it gave you a sense of what happens when people, when a community feels the hurt and something happens. People said that they, that the radio said that black people are not riding the buses. And so more black people stopped riding the buses. And people were offered rides and refused them. And I remember Dr. King in his letter from the Birmingham jail saying, one day the South will rise up and recognize its true heroes. And he quotes the woman who said in what he said was in a grammatical uh, profundity, she said, when she was asked, offered a ride, she said, she was 72, and she said, my feet is tired, but my soul is rested. And I think we need to realize that there was a, a deep spiritual quality in the suffering that people had, the kind that Dr. King said is always redemptive. And it was for the cause that they were, were suffering. The other thing that I hope we see in this, and that to me means so much, is the role of women that is often not marked. And I am so pleased that this weekend we will honor Juanita Abernathy and Coretta Scott King and Rosa Parks as symbols of the role women played, the role that children played the role that youth played in this whole effort. I say that because I often find young people who feel that the whole effort began with Dr. King's speech, I have a dream. When Dr. King was not just talking about a dream and a dreamer, Dr. King was not assassinated because of that. He was assassinated because he dared to change the system that he took up this and that all of us uh, uh, really uh, pursued it and followed it. And also, Rosa Parks lets us know, one person can make a difference. One person who really has a commitment. And the thing that she told me and told a group that I was in, in 1956 has always stood with me, she said, that she'd been to Mount Eagle, Tennessee, to a retreat. And in that retreat, there were daily messages. And there was someone who always said, you are a child of God. You have talent. You can make a difference. And she said that as she sat there on that bus and refused to give it a her seat, it was almost as if she could hear a voice say, Rosa Parks, you're a child of God. You can make a difference. And she said, nothing they said to her could, was louder than that that she could hear inwardly. And I think if we look at this and recognize the way in which every day of our lives, we can make some difference. But collectively, we can make a great deal of difference if all of us are willing, if each of us is willing to use our own talents. In one of the moments of, of uh, reflection, I suddenly realized that in the Rosa Parks, we have, if we could just stay with this, that we would have a message that so many today who are going through open doors have inherited opportunity. They go through open doors and don't know how they got open. Mm -hmm. Or that we find ourselves in minutia talking about, well, this did this to one person or the other. It takes great strength and courage and dedication and commitment to do 
as a lawyer like this has done, to do like Rosa Parks has done. Because what it really, what it represents is a kind of determination that goes beyond our personal interests to our recognizing that we have a society that we have to change, that we have systems that we have to change. But we have in, in the stories, the messages, the pictures, the experiences that we're commemorating now, evidence of the fact that we can use ourselves and all that we have to help open doors, but more importantly, to pry them fully open. We've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. But we can be thankful that there was a woman like Rosa Parks, and that there were those whose names will never be known, thousands and thousands whose names no one will be able to mention. The women we heard about tonight, who I met Ms. Uh, Ms. Collins just a few months, weeks ago, and realized that here as a teenager, she had dared to take a stand. And that all of us are the beneficiaries of what has been done. And the question is, how do we take it from here and make our difference? Thank you. We'll take a few questions to the left here and then to the right here, upstairs to the left and upstairs to the right if there's anyone there, then we'll come back to the left. First, Karen Kalish, who is a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School, uh, who also is the founder and president of an organization called Operation Understanding DC that takes a group of uh, African-American and Jewish high school students to historic sites uh, throughout the country to look at the civil rights movement, and they also went to uh, Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, Ms. Kayla, is your first question or comment to the panel? Well, before I get to my question, I want to say that every year we take the students to Montgomery and meet with 15 women, 10 to 15 women, who planned and carried out with them the Montgomery bus boycott. And it is the most inspirational day of a month-long trip throughout the South and um, New York City and Chicago. So if ever you all ever get to Montgomery, please don't miss seeing Dexter Avenue Baptist Church and Holt Street Baptist Church and learning the history before you go. It's a really, it's my, it's the most inspirational story that, it, for me in all of history. Um, I have two questions. One of them is, Ms. Abernathy, I'm glad you mentioned Vernon Johns, but I wondered if you could share a little bit more about Vernon Johns with the audience, because from what I know, he was for his whole time at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, right before Martin Luther King was there, he kept asking his congregation to stop riding the buses. And they finally fired him almost over this issue, as far as I understand it. So I wonder if I, well, you, you can correct me and tell all of us about that. And the other question I have is that we talk, the laws have been changed, but the hearts and minds of people haven't been changed. As Dr. Height says, the door's been opened pride open, but there's a lot more work to do. And I want to hear from you all what we, and especially these young people here, both black and white, can do to pry that door open farther and farther and farther. Who wants to take Dr. Uh, Brennan Johns first? Reverend Johns? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Johns was um, an intellectual and um, a very, 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 very brave man. And Dr. John staged one-man protest on the bus against the bus system. And he used to make the statement that um, when he would refuse to give up his seat on the bus and they'd throw him off, he'd go to the barber shop and ask, well, what are they saying around here about what happened on the bus the other day? And he said the people would say, well, you ought to know better. And, but it didn't deter him. He was very eccentric and ahead of his time. Dr. Johns was, I, I always told him, was very much like my father. He believed that 
he was talking about economic power among African Americans when almost nobody was talking about it. He said that you, we would never be free until we had some economic power within the black race. And he would, he set up a foundation called Black Montgomery Enterprise Development, I think it was. He sold vegetables. Now this was a well-educated man who lectured at Harvard, here, Yale, Princeton, all over the country. But he didn't care about how he, you know, looked. He was not concerned about wearing the finest suits because it was here. It was in his head. And that was what really mattered, what you did with what knowledge you had. And Dr. Johns was not the kind of dapper, I'd say, pastor that Dexter had um, perceived their pastor to be so to speak. An intellectual, yes. He could open the Bible. He could start reciting scriptures. You can open your Bible and follow him along, and he would not miss a word. He had a photographic memory. And I don't think at Montgomery and, and Dexter was really ready for him because he was not the traditional minister. He said that you had to be in business. You can't beg the white man and fight him too. So you have to become independent. And his problem, I think, within the church was he would cut watermelons and sell them in the basement after a wedding. OK, those kind of, of um, <laughs> out of the ordinary things that people in cultured situations just don't do. So that's what, why I mean when I say he was eccentric. And I think that was more or less some of what they didn't like about Dr. Johns than his not, uh, his trying to get them to not ride the bus. He tried to get them to be concerned about becoming entrepreneurs. And in that day and time, everybody had a job. And most of his parishioners were on the faculty at Alabama State College, our teachers in, this, in, the, in the Montgomery school system. So when you say become independent and go into business, black's mindset at that point in time was not entrepreneurship. So he was way ahead of himself with that respect, in that respect. So that's why I think he had them selling stockings, for instance. He had people selling hams, because he was a Virginian by, by birth. And, and a farmer. He had vegetables to be sold to people. He was that kind of, of, of indivi individual. So he was quite unusual, but a very brilliant intellectual. Let me take the next question, and uh, you want to, we'll end up with the broader question. Where do we go from here? Next question. Well, she had asked, uh, where do we go from here? So I didn't know if you all wanted to address that before my Did, question. Was that your question? We're going to end with that one. Well, yeah, that's, that's the one you want to ask now? I'll, I'll ask that. Okay. What should this generation do, do Dr. Hyde? Well, I think one of the things is what you're doing now, and to go deeper, and get a real understanding of what the struggle has been and to understand the legal, the, the structures under which you live and how those do or do not promote justice. I remember Dr. King said, don't talk about all the honors I have. Always remember me as a drum major for justice. I think that, the, and the reason I cite my experience in comparison to Juanita Abernathy and Fred uh, Gray is that I have never lived in the segregated South, although I was born there. I have never been a student in a segregated class, but I feel 
and people always ask me, how did you get to be this way? I said, because I try to keep up and to understand what is happening and to identify with the struggle. I feel it as if I grew up in it. And I think that's a part of what we have to do. I think we are too prone to try to look at it just purely intellectually. Think about how you would feel under the conditions that have been described. Think about how a 23-year-old lawyer tackles the system that is so unjust. See what it means? And, and think about the lessons of the, of the nonviolent movement, which focused not on personalities, but on systems, on structures, on the conditions under which you live. And I think, I hear us too, too, too many of our young people focusing on things that are more individualistic, when in reality, we have to begin to think about ourselves as persons, as individuals, and our personhood is fundamental, but we have to identify with the people, with, with the public, with whoever you want to call it. But we have to look, identify with what is justice, and not just stress law and order, but make equality and justice something that we keep looking at and trying to work for. Mr. Gray? Where we go from here? I think there's several things, and, and to put it in, in proper perspective, Alabama and Montgomery today is not the same city and state uh, as it existed in 1955. Now, we've made some progress in, in the field of uh, desegregation. We've made some progress economically. It's not the same state that George Wallace, when he said segregation today, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. And when I saw him say that, we immediately filed more lawsuits that brought <laughs> about more integration than any other time. But we have a different governor. Governor Don Sigelman, uh, while Wallace talked about segregation forever, the first four individuals who appeared on his inauguration two years ago were African Americans, from the person who, uh, uh, who was the presider, master of ceremony, black lawyer, J. Mason Davis, to the lady who sung the Star Spangled Banner and Stars Fell on Alabama, to uh, the Secretary of Transportation, and even Fred Gray was asked to make some remarks, which is on, 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 on the star of the Capitol. Now, that's the good part. <laughs> and of course, we have two federal district judges now. One, uh, Judge Clemens is now chief judge in the Northern District of Alabama, and uh, uh, Judge Thompson is a former chief judge in the Mill District. The other side of and Alabama now has about 25% of our legislators are black. And they are that way because a black man drew up the redistricting plan that the legislature went along with, and a black judge approved it, and ultimately, the white judges on the Alabama Supreme Court approved it. But now, what has happened? This past spring, a three-judge district court in Montgomery, Alabama, declared a part of our redistricting act to be unconstitutional. It's now pending on a petition for certiorari to the United States Supreme Court. We had two African Americans who was on the Alabama Supreme Court who were there now, but who ran for re-election in November. And guess what happened? They were not re-elected. They elected white individuals, don't have any kind of qualifications compared to them. So for the first time in two decades in Alabama, we will not have an African American on the highest court in our state. So we are at a point now where the wrong signal is being given. The signal is that African Americans and minorities have too much power, they have too much control, they have too many rights, so we're going to have to cut it back. And it's the kind of attitude that's being demonstrated really by the appointees on the Supreme Court and the whole federal judiciary. We are losing the battle in the federal courts now. 
what are we going to do? And I will even mention the situation as it has developed down in Florida on this last election. But I think there are a couple of things that we can do at this crucial point in our history. And I mention these things because it is crucial. Because some of us think that we are out of the woods and that it's all over. But I am now trying. I have over 45 desegregation cases in Alabama that I filed in 1963. And we still don't have terminal decrees in them. So what we're going to have to do is several things. One, you as young people are going to have to realize that racism is still alive in this country. And I think what our institutions of higher learning and what the city and, and county and state government needs to acknowledge the fact that race still, racism is still there. And you can say it as long as you want to, but until you're able to see numbers and see things and see people and see changes, we will never be able to do it. Now, you can start, and my daughter told me this. This is a simple thing. She says, uh, Daddy, you go all over the country making speeches, but why don't you try this? Tell your audiences that one thing you can do select a person of a different race to be your best friend. Not someone who's just a casual acquaintance, but somebody you can tell your intimate secrets to. What you will end up finding out, you will learn something about them. We really differ because basically we don't know each other. You go to school together, you sit by each other, but you don't know what you like, you don't know what you eat, you don't know what background you're from, and whenever you get in a setting, when you look around and everybody in that setting look just like you, something is wrong. Whether it's all women or all male or all female or all black or all white. So it has to start there. And then you have to have a personal commitment that racism is wrong and be willing for you to find your little nick. I can't tell you where it is. But you are intelligent. You have education. You can't tell me this country, with all of the knowledge we have and what we can do in outer space, that we can't solve the race problem in this country. We don't do it because we haven't really tried to do it. And we need to do it. Thank you. Mike to the right and then to the left. First, I'd like to thank this esteemed panel. My name is Adam Taylor. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. The Montgomery boy bus boycott inspired movements around the world, whether it was in South Africa, whether it was in East Germany, et cetera. And I'm wondering, what do you see as the internationalization of this movement? We are facing many international problems in terms of global inequality, of debt, of AIDS, the AIDS pandemic. And we have exported many of our structures that I think are racist and are exploitative to other parts of the world. So I'm wondering what the panel would offer in terms of insights of how the civil rights struggle and movement has become international, how it can further become more international in the future. Start with Ms. Abernathy. I think, first of all, America, we talk a good game, but we really are not practicing what we preach. And honestly, we are not as effective in our pursuits of eradicating discrimination around the world as we could be, because other nations are looking at the injustices within our borders and saying that we can't teach them how to live when we're not living it ourselves. Racism is institutionalized all over America. And what you as young people can do is remember that Martin Luther King and Ralph David Abernathy were young men. And do not, you cannot tolerate any facets of racism. Racial slurs, for instance, racial jokes. You hear these racist jokes and laugh about them. It's little things like that that you should not tolerate because it starts small and manifests itself in 
so many other varied ways. So you can be very uncomfortable with the bits of racism that you experience every day. We see it in organizations to which we belong. You should be very uncomfortable, be uncomfortable belonging to an organization that refuses to allow blacks and other minorities to participate in it. You should be very uncomfortable living in communities, and you will soon be out on your own. You should be very uncomfortable living in a community that's an exclusively middle class, upper middle class, lily white community. And when blacks move in, you move out. Those are signs of racism that you cannot tolerate. Everybody can do something. We belong to churches where if blacks come in and join the church, certain people decide, I no longer want to be a part of the membership. Everybody can do something, but you have to find your niche. But first of all, do not tolerate racism and injustice and inequality wherever you see it. Because as long as you tolerate it and pretend that it does not exist, it will never, ever go away. And you are young, but after a while, you will have children, many of you, that will go to schools where black children will not be allowed to attend. And when you find situations like that, our black children are brilliant. If given the opportunity, we can do anything. And you, as mothers and fathers, should not be satisfied being a parent in an institution that is not open to all American citizens. These are basic things that I feel everybody within this room or in Harvard University can participate in. And do not let them set you up in class categories, as I said to the MBA students here. Make you feel like you're different. You know, they told us during the movement, we wouldn't mind being associated, Ms. Abernathy, with blacks if all of them were like you. You see, they will tell you, you know, we wouldn't object to having blacks in our organization if they were all as t intelligent and as well educated as you. That's racism. We are all intelligent. If you, but you went to Harvard, you see, so you're different. That's a part of the caste and class systems that the Lynch theory talked about back in the 1700s. And we are still abiding by that, by allowing America to set up class and caste within the black race. And you shouldn't tolerate that. Because that breeds contempt, it breeds discrimination and racism within the black community. Light-skinned blacks against darker-skinned blacks, kinky hair against curly hair. We have to face it wherever we see it. And believe me when I tell you, it's within our race too. So we as blacks have to not accept it and not tolerate it within our groups and then don't uh, tolerate it from the outer group. Yes. I think one of the things we have to bear in mind on an international scale, as we're talking about democracy, we're trying to work with improving civil society and the like, is to realize that the, the minority majority concepts that we have lived with will no longer be valid, and that we have to live in a different kind of world. It'll be more like what the world, our country will be more like what the world is, because two thirds of the people of the world are colored. And I think that's something that we have to begin to prepare ourselves to live with and realize that that's the demographics in our own nation are changing fast. And it is the enlightened self-interest of all of us to learn how to live with diversity and value pluralism and do it in a democratic fashion. We're gonna try to get a few more quick questions in and quick answers uh, to the left up here. 
Um, I would like to thank the panel, like with everyone else, for uh, for coming tonight. This is very enlightening. My name is Earl Adams, and I'm a first year MPP student here, and I'm also a proud graduate of Morehouse College. Um, and it, so it warms my heart to have folks from the South up here. Um, I have. You know, I'm also, interestingly enough, a uh, dual degree student at Boston College Law School, so Professor Ogletree, I will respect uh, getting to the question tonight. Um, <laughs> several things are on my mind, but specifically two things. Um, if the panel could, ad could address, in their opinion, why Alabama? Why Montgomery? Why that city, um, as compared to all of the other cities in the South that were existing uh, under similar conditions, um, in particular Atlanta, uh, home of the largest number of African American collegians uh, now and just like then. Um, what was it special about Montgomery, Alabama on during that time? And Mr. Gray, you did speak to it, but I'm curious, were, were there any other forces that came together that made Alabama uh, the, the, the hot spot at that point? Okay. And then secondly, um, the age of the individuals who were, who were actually leading this movement, it, it really astounds me to hear it, because myself, I will be a, an attorney, uh, God willing, uh, at age 25. Well, at age 25, Mr. Ray, you were already uh, fighting these important cases in the courtrooms. Um, and, that, and it just astounds me to, to hear the ages and, and the supposed, what some might say, immaturity of um, the individuals who were leading, but in fact, it was totally opposite. And so I'm curious to know, what was it at that that point in time that at that point in time that gave you all the strength to believe that you could change the world? And then if you could relate it to what you see going on today with our generation, and why perhaps we are not as ready to go out there and, um, in, in a sense, take the brick in the head uh, for the sake of the cause. Mr. Gray. Uh, I alluded to a part of what you talked about, and I think the emergence of events and times and places was important. It was important that you have a lawyer, it was important that you have litigants, it was important that you have a judge like Frank M. Johnson, Jr., mm -hmm. who would rule right in a given situation. And then you had, I don't think any other issue other than the buses would have worked in Montgomery. Mm -hmm. Everybody related to it Everybody knew about the problem. It wasn't something that was made up. This was real, a reality, and it was something that was dear to everybody's heart. And all they were waiting on was somebody to say, let's stay off the buses, and here's a way to get us to where we're going. And I think you did have a group of young persons who were there. But don't forget, there were also some old persons who were there, who really were examples, and who worked with us. It was a combination. And any time you get ready to do have a movement, it's going to take a combination of a whole lot of folks in order to make it go. But you also had, even in the, in the community, because our, in the earlier cases, there was more con concern in the community, then I think this is something that is hard for us, many who've lived in the North, to realize that for many people, there were so many reprisals and so much fear of reprisal that they would, would they tried to ease things along. So to, to dare as, by the time you were, because in the earlier instances, as I understand it, there were those who questioned, you know, you're upsetting things. Yeah, you know, there was a, a feeling of just comfort, just human comfort. And I think this is one thing that we have to recognize, that people ri made risks, they took risks. This was not just a matter of, of doing something, they, they took risks to do it. You asked the question, why Montgomery? One of the things that happened in Birmingham and Mobile in Alabama, they had certain areas in the bus, on the buses, where blacks could sit. We had that in Montgomery, but the final decision was left into the hands of the bus drivers. You see, they had, in Mobile, I understand there was, a, let's say, five seats allowed for blacks, and there was a sign, blacks seat from this sign backward to the back of the bus. 
Well, in Montgomery, they had the, the, the rule that you black seat from the back to the front and the first 10 seats and whites began seating from the front toward the back. But if more whites got on the bus and they needed the seats in the black area, blacks had to get up because Rosa was not sitting in the white area. She was seated in a seat designated for blacks. But you see, it was an imaginary line. And people were tired of getting off of work, paying their dimes put at the front of the bus before they could walk to the back. The bus will have pulled off many times. Sometimes they would put their money in, in, the, front, in the front, and before they could enter, they would get one foot in, and the bus driver would pull off, dragging them down the street. All sorts of things where you see, in other communities, they didn't have as much of this blatant abuse as they had in Montgomery. That's why I think Montgomery was unique in that respect. But the young people participated, the older people participated. It was a concerted effort by the entire community because the bus was one thing that everybody could identify with. If you didn't ride the bus, you knew somebody who rode it. You had a neighbor or you had some experience with what had been said to bus to the people on the passengers on the bus by the mean bus drivers. And I understand that the bus driver who was determined to take Rosa Parks to jail had had an encounter with her once before. So he just was one of the racist ones who were just saying, I'm going to do all I can to these black folk and make them as angry as I can. So the community was tired. Uh, our time has expired. What I'm going to do, because we, we are well over, uh, I was going to try to get two more questions. And what I'm actually going to do uh, is ask the, the four people here if, uh, to put your name, I know, but, but to put your, you know, just quickly say your name and your question, but put all the questions in if they're brief questions. And then in their closing comments, let the panelists pick which of the questions they want to answer if they're different. Uh, name and question. Uh, James Faison. Um, my question is that uh, do you believe that the, the um, problems facing minority groups are uniform and that they allow minority groups to confront the issues as a collective group? Or are they more cross-cutting, thereby forcing ethnic groups to to address different issues along separate ethnic lines. Okay, and question here? My name is Nina Sawyer and I'm an undergraduate here and I'm from Montgomery, so it's a particular pleasure for me. My question relates back to Montgomery. I had an, and relates to my experience going to a public high school there. Um, you've talked about a lot of things that you could do, where do we go from here? But from my experience, there's kind of a feeling of stagnation, that there's a sense that there is still racism, but it, the system just exists and the cycle continues. And I'm wondering what you think specific steps Montgomery could take, changes, maybe parts, system changes that they could do to actually change this kind of implicit racism that's in place now. Okay, next question there. Callie Crossley, first I would encourage everybody here to celebrate the um, 45th anniversary by watching the first hour of Eyes on the Prize with the real witnesses talking about it as you prepare for the feature presentation in December. What Second, time is that on uh, December 1st? Um, I'm just saying it's just to go to the library oh. and rent it and watch it. It's the first, first hour of Eyes on the Prize. Real story, Montgomery Boys boycott. My big question though is this, and it's a, it's a hard one to ask because it makes me sad. Um, all of you are icons of the movement. As a young man set up in the, in the rafters there, you were very young when all of this started. I see nobody behind you to whom you can pass the torch. I wonder who do you see um, coming up behind you who has the mission, uh, the vision, the commitment to the movement in the way that you did that will continue. Because as we know, the civil rights movement is a spectrum and it's not over yet. Final question here. Dalla Karaj, the Radcliffe Institute. My question is really about the history of the civil rights movement outside of Montgomery County and outside of America even. You've spoken a lot about nonviolence and I wondered if you could speak about the influences internationally in the struggles against British Empire, perhaps in South Asia or in Africa, that might have influenced the events that happened in that one 
instance. Thank you. Okay, let me try to summarize the, the four areas and then the speakers can pick, pick any one of them and take a minute and you're kind of closing. That is, are there different uh, methods uh, in, in fighting the struggle among races? You know, if you're not just talking about African Americans. Are there structural things that can be done specifically in Montgomery to change uh, Montgomery? Uh, where's, where's the next generation uh, of leadership that you see, or do you see it, uh, any symbols of leadership to follow up on what uh, has occurred um, uh, in, the, in the last uh, 45 years since 1955? Uh, um, and and, and the, the broader question is what are some of the lessons we take from what happened in 1955? So you can pick any piece of that or choose whatever kind of point you want to make in your closing comments. Um, Ms. Abernathy, you want to go first? In response to the young lady over here about the um, protest around the world, we patterned a lot of what we did naturally from in Montgomery nonviolently from Christ, but also from Mahatma Gandhi in India and how he led the movement there because this was something that we could see on our planet. I think in Montgomery, as I said it before, we've got to come together more as people. And all cities are just like Montgomery. If they're in the north, south, east, or west. Montgomery may be more racist than some communities. But basically, the same thing happens in Chicago. Because I felt more like I was going to be slaughtered marching in Cisco, Cicero in Chicago than I did in Jackson, Mississippi. So it's all over America. And we have got to recognize that it's not a southern thing, it's all over. It's an American phenomenon. And each of you, I feel, must decide that you are not going to tolerate it and do something. Bloom where you are planted. And if you look closely enough, you can find your niche. Dr. Hyde? That looking at the at the broad picture, that we in this country uh, have worked to against apartheid in South Africa. I think we've learned a lot as we have worked together, and that we have seen that while we talk about human rights, that we, it's really human rights around the world that, that we all have to work for. I think that's one thing. But one thing that has been lingering with me all evening is, while we were working on the buses in South, in um, Montgomery, we always ha have to bear in mind, because I remember the children in Selma, the women the young women who went to jails and were treated in all kinds of ways. The, the young people who said it most, many times, that they went out to struggle to get the right to vote. And I think we don't want to forget that the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was the result of so many people who gave their lives to get that right to vote and that every time the Voting Rights Act comes up for renewal, it's almost like starting all over again, and that all of us have to be alert to even old legislation that we think is in the rights. Because what we have found is so many of the gains that we made seem now more tentative, and we have to keep winning them again and again. And so it isn't a question that it's, it's over. It is a question that we're still in the struggle. I, I know that I get this question all the time. I know that people think 
Well, we don't have a Martin Luther King Jr. A Rosa Parks is old and so on and so forth. But I think the other thing is that if we learned anything, this was a movement, that it, it was something that was, was carried forward, and that this movement is, is not limited. It doesn't need a, quote, a one leader. We had Abernathy, we had Fred Gray, we had King, we had others. But the important thing now is that many of those un pieces of unfinished business depend on what we do. And that we have to use every group of which we are a part, every opportunity that we have when we come together to help each other learn how we, in the kind of things that Fred Gray is suggesting, how we steadily move forward. But even bear in mind, don't ever forget, and I think the present climate around the presidential election should let us know that every vote counts. And that for us, who are part of those who did not, for women for that matter, but particularly for those of, in our country who had to fight for the right to vote, the vote is very precious. But the tragedy for me is that we have to go into some of those areas now and say to people, get out and vote. I hope after this we'll never have to do that again. But I want us always to bear in mind that those pieces of legislation we have really are not just there. We have laws, but we need enforcement. And that's where all of us come in. Mr. Gray? A year ago in Montgomery, whites and blacks together elected a new mayor and put the old mayor out who had been there for some 23 years. A year earlier, whites and blacks together in Alabama elected a new governor. Now, unfortunately, that new mayor and that new governor did not use their influence during the last election to help the black elected these judges who were not any real liberals some of their decisions were conservative, and I didn't like them, but they were good judges. Mm -hmm. So uh, once we elect persons, those persons are going to have to use their influence to influence others. It's not enough for them to get elected and then get in a secure position. Next, I think, and what we're trying to do in Tuskegee now, we're living really in a multicultural society. We have started the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center. It's a museum and a center that is designed to show the contributions made by the various ethnic groups in our community. Basically, we have Native Americans, we have uh, European Americans and African Americans. And in one center, you will be able to see the contributions that all of us have made. And when you're able to see those contributions, you'll find we have a lot more things in common than we have against each other, but we need to be able to educate ourselves. And don't fool yourself. You can make a difference. Dr. Martin Luther King didn't start out as a hero. Rosa Parks didn't start out as the mother of the civil rights movement. Uh, Ralph Abernathy didn't start out as anything other than a Baptist preacher in Montgomery. But they all worked hard, they had commitments, and as a result of that, they grew and they developed, and so can you. Let me say this in, in closing. It is, uh, I think, uh, important that we are here. This is the John F. Kennedy School and School of Government uh, and a government of laws and not of, of men. And it reflects, in many respects, in the name, a sense that it's a place that we come and we analyze and discuss and debate uh, the issues of the day and of time. And the question earlier was a profound one. You know, why Montgomery and why so young? And in an institution like this, you might get a theoretical answer about the timing of the year and the education and et cetera. But the true answer, in my view, the essence of the answer is why Montgomery and why so young, uh, it's that it's, it was God. I mean, it wasn't, you know, just geography. 
or timing. It was God. And I'm not trying to preach religion to anybody, but I'm saying it took divine intervention for Fred Gray to go to law school with the sole purpose of desegregating his home state and for the people to have faith in him as a lawyer uh, when he didn't have any cases or any clients or any experience to handle the most significant case in the history of Alabama and one of the most significant cases in the history of our nation. And it took divine intervention for Ralph Abernathy had a very comfortable job as a preacher in another part of town. I had a comfortable home and a family and people who loved him to put his life on the line, not just in Montgomery, but when that happened, Martin said, let's go to Chicago and Detroit and Memphis. That, that wasn't accidental. And it took divine in intervention for Dr. Dorothy Hyde, who never went to segregated settings or lived in segregated settings to say, I'm gonna dedicate my life to promoting the interest of women and women of color around the world. Uh, and got involved with all, the, all her degrees. She's got legitimate degrees on her own, just academic degrees, but dozens of honorary degrees to reflect what she's done. And the age is significant because you don't just create, I, I wish we could talk about Frank Johnson. You don't create a Frank Johnson out of whole cloth. This is the, one of the most significant and unheralded judges in the history of our country who had to be there. And so, there is something that's beyond a theoretical notion right. or beyond time or space that's beyond all of our comprehension. It happened in Montgomery on December 1st, 1955. It could happen in Cambridge, Massachusetts mm -hmm. in 2000. It's just that accidental, and yet look what happened. <laughs> and so I hope that you will see this as, as I start with the history lesson, that you can talk about this and dissect it, but you need to call your grandparents and aunts and uncles and tell them that you met Dr. Dorothy Hyde and Juanita Abernathy and Fred Gray. They don't know them. You need to tell them you heard about uh, uh, Miss Colvin, the first woman, 15-year-old, who was really arrested and wasn't the case that Fred Gray didn't say this because she was pregnant. She wouldn't have been a good symbol for the movement to have a 15-year-old pregnant woman symbolizing the question of desegregation. And you need to talk about beyond the sanctity and the, and the uh, cleansing sense of this environment, uh, we didn't talk about the dogs. We didn't talk about the police harassment. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about people being pulled off buses, losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. And this was not a, a uh, boycott in the middle of the summer when people were on vacation. It was just about to become winter in America. And we forget it started December 1st, but it lasted for an entire year. An entire year through the winter and through the spring and through the summer and through the fall and through the winter again before it's finally resolved. That's resilience. There aren't movements that last. The movements are now like an hour. People get arrested by appointment in the civil rights movement now. That's right. <laughs> Things have changed, and I think that we really need to see this as history in the making, that they have come to us to tell us how they did it, but they've also done something else. They've given us a blueprint to say, yes, it's within your capacity. You, you're not too young. You're not too inexper inexperienced. You're not too naive to be able to change the world. It takes one person with courage and commitment to make it happen. We have three of them here tonight as symbols of the shoulders we stand on, and we are indebted to them for coming to Harvard and sharing with us their views about a movement that started 55 years ago, 45 years ago, but that is important on December 1st, 2000, as it was on December 1st, 1955. Again, please join me in thanking all of our speakers for their comments. Today.